Hello, my name is Dr. Jeffrey Thompson, Senior Pastor for the Fort Lauderdale Seventh Adventist Church. On behalf of the Board of Elders, it is my happy pleasure to welcome you to our telecast. Just before we open the Word of the Lord today, let us bow our heads in a moment of prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this awesome new day you have given to us. Bless us. May heaven come down. May glory fill our souls, for we ask it in Jesus' name. I would like to speak on the topic, Ask, Seek, and Knock. But just before the message today, let us listen to infinite praise. My text is taken from St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, beginning from verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? I don't know about you, but I just love the reading of this particular passage of Scripture from the Message Bible. Don't bargain with God. Be direct. Ask for what you need. This isn't a cat and mouse hide and seek game we're in. If your child asks for bread, do you trick him with sawdust? If he asks for fish, do you scare him with a live snake on his plate? As bad as you are, you wouldn't think of such a thing. You are at least decent to your own children. So don't you think the God who conceived you in love will be even better? 
Uh, the verse uh, that I read, in fact, all of the verses that I read uh, emanate from the Sermon on the Mount. Yes, the Sermon on the Mount is recorded in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapters 5 through 7. Jesus delivered this message near the beginning of his ministry. What is the Sermon on the Mount? Well, simply put, Jesus' longest explanation of what it looks like to live as his follower. And so my favorite author says, and I quote, the Sermon on the Mount is heaven's benediction to the world, a voice from the throne of God. It was given to man to be uh, to them the Lord of duty and the light of heaven, their hope and consolation in despondency, their joy and comfort in all the vicissitudes and walks of life. Here are the prince of preachers, the master teacher, others, uh, the words that the Father gave him to speak, unquote. For example, Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount about subjects such as prayer, justice, care for the needy, handling religious law, divorce, fasting, judging other people, salvation, the Beatitudes, and the Lord's Prayer, and even more. Jesus' words are practical. Jesus' words are concise. He was truly a master orator. He was truly a master teacher. For example, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, he says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Speaking of asking, in surgery for a heart attack, a middle-aged woman has a vision of the Lord by her bedside. Will I die, she asks. Uh, the Lord says, no, 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 you have 30 more years to live. With 30 years to look forward to, she decides to make the best of it. Since she's in a hospital, she gets liposuction, a tummy tuck, hair transplants, and collagen injection in her lips. She looks great. She looks fantastic. Uh, the day she's discharged, she exits the hospital with a swagger, with a vim and vitality in her step. She crosses the street and is immediately hit by an ambulance and killed. Long story short, up in heaven, she sees the Lord and she says, you said I had 30 more years to live, she complains. That's true, says the Lord. So what happened, she asks. The Lord says, I didn't recognize you. Now one of the greatest flaws of this fast-paced world is how little desire we have to pray. But if there was ever a time we needed to pray as a nation, that time is now. Imagine the greatest invitation in the world is extended to us, and we generally turn away to other things. We are so easily distracted. For instance, God sent us an invitation to the greatest banquet that ever was. And we sent word back and said, I have bought a field and I must go and see it. Or I have bought five yoke of oxen and I must go uh, to examine them. Or I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. And so the excuses go on and on. And so in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus invites us to pray three times. He wants us uh, to ask uh, him for uh, what we need. And so it's the number of times that he invites us to pray that gets my attention. This pikes my interest immediately. Because in verses 7, uh, he says, and 80 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who acts receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Repetition deepens the impression. In other words, ask your heavenly Father for what you need, 
not what you want. Seek your father uh, for the help uh, that you need. Knock on the door of your father's house so he will open it and give you what you need. And so acts seek a knock. Speaking of seeking, a man is struggling to find a parking space. Lord, he prays, I can't stand this. If you open a space for me, I swear I'll give up drinking and I will go to church every single Sunday. Suddenly the clouds part and the sun shines on an empty parking spot. Without hesitation, the man says, never mind, I found one. And so Jesus tells us that prayer begins with the posture of a beggar coming before our Heavenly Father. We are to ask God for what we need, knowing that He will supply it according to His riches and glory. And so pr the promise is amazingly simple. Ask and you shall have. If you need food, ask God for it. If you need money uh, to pay your bills during COVID-19, ask God for it. If you need wisdom, if you need guidance, ask Almighty God for it. If you are confused, ask God for compassion. If you are in need of physical healing, do not be ashamed or embarrassed to bring your needs to the Lord in prayer. Because I've come by to tell you that burdens are lifted at Calvary. Yes, my friend, I want you to know this is what it means to ask God for daily bread. Asking involves laying all of life before Almighty God in order that you might receive from him that which you need. Yes, when we go to the second portion of Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, it says, seek and you will find. Yes, seek and you will find, not might find. Seeking implies a desire for something of great value. It reminds us of Jesus' story of the woman searching for the lost coin or the shepherd with the 100 sheep who, having lost one, left the 99 and 9 and went searching for the one that had gone astray. Yes, when you seek something, you rearrange your priorities. In other words, you reset your agenda so you can search for it until you find it. Speaking of seeking, a man approaches a very beautiful woman in a large supermarket and says, I have lost my wife in the aisles. Would you mind talking to me for a couple of minutes? Why, the woman replies. Well, because every time I speak to a pretty lady, my wife appears out of nowhere, the man said. Oh, my friend, when you pray for temporal blessings, remember that the Lord may see that it is not for your good or for his glory to give you just what you desire. But he will answer your prayer, giving you just what is best for you. When Paul prayed that the thorn in his flesh might be removed, the Lord answered his prayer, not by removing the thorn, but by giving him grace to bear his trial. And I say, Amen. Yes, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, beginning from verse 7, uh, we have the story. It says, And lest I should be exalted above measure, by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure 
in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And I say, praise the Lord. Yes, my friend, when the sick pray for the recovery of health, the Lord does not always answer their prayer in just the way they desire. But even though they may not be immediately healed, he will give them that which is far more value, grace, to bear their sickness. Oh yes, make sure your requests are known to your maker. Never is one repulsed who comes to him with a contrite heart. Not one sincere prayer is lost amid the anthems of celestial choir. God hears the cries of the weakest human being. We pour out our heart's desires in our closets. We bathe and breathe a prayer as we walk by the way. And our words reach the throne of the monarch of the universe. They may be inaudible to any human ear, but they cannot die away into silence nor can they be lost through the activities of business that are going on. Nothing can drown the soul's desire. It rises above the din of the street, above the confusion of the multitude to the heavenly courts. It is God to whom we are speaking, and our prayer is heard. You who feel the most unworthy, fear not. Uh, to commit your case to God. And I say praise the Lord. Yes, my friend, there is a mighty power in prayer. Our great adversary is constantly seeking uh, to keep the troubled soul away from God. An appeal to heaven by the humblest saint is more to be dreaded by Satan than the decrees of cabinets or the mandates of kings. Oh yes, my friend, and that is why the prophet Isaiah still says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run. I said they shall run. I said they shall run. I said they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint, the Bible says. Oh yes, my friend, much prayer is necessary to successful effort. Prayer brings power. Prayer has subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, and turned to flight the armies of aliens. Oh my friends, Jesus lived in dependence upon God and communion with him to the secret place of the Most High under the shadow of the Almighty man now and then repair they abide for a season and the result is manifest in noble deeds then their fate fails or the communion is interrupted and the life work marred but the life of Jesus was a life of constant trust, sustained by continual communion. And his service uh, for heaven and earth was without failing or faltering. Oh, my friend, prayer is the breath of the soul. That is what my favorite author says. It is the secret of spiritual power. No other means of grace can be substituted and the health of the soul be preserved. Prayer brings the heart into immediate contact with the wellspring of life and strengthens the sinew and muscles of the religious experience. Oh yes, my friends, family prayer and public prayer have their place, but it is secret communion with God that sustains the soul. It was in the mount with God that Moses beheld the pattern of that wonderful building which was to be the abiding place 
of his glory. Yes, it is an amount with God, the secret place of communion that we are to contemplate his glorious ideal for humanity. Thus, we shall be enabled so to fashion our character building that to us may be fulfilled of the promise. And so, my friends, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says, verse 16, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And so that is why when we come to the book of Job chapter 22 and verse 21, Job cries out and says, Acquaint thou thyself with him and be at peace. And so if you want to have everlasting peace, you need to have an encounter with Almighty God. Seek and you shall find. God is seeking you. And the very desire you feel to come to him is but the drawing of his Holy Spirit. Oh yes, my friend. Yield to that drawing. Christ is pleading the cause of the tempted, the erring, and the faithless. He is seeking to lift them into companionship with himself. And that is why in First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9, it says, If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. The third portion of Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says, Knock, and the door will be opened, and to him who knocks the door will be opened. Yes, my friend, the word knock means to stand at a door and repeatedly rap it with knuckles. You knock and wait, then you knock again, then you say, I know you are in there. And so you just knock repeatedly. And so, my friend, speaking of knocking, a new pastor was visiting the homes of his parishioners. At one house, it seemed obvious that someone was at home, but no answer came from the door. Therefore, he took out his business card and wrote on the back of it, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, and then he just stuck it in the door. When the offering uh, was uh, processed the following Sunday, he found his card had been returned. Added to it was the cryptic message, Genesis chapter 3 and the verse 10. Reaching for his Bible to check out the citation, he broke into laughter. Because Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Genesis chapter 3 says, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, for I was naked. Oh yes, my friend, knock. We come to God by special invitation, and he waits to welcome us to his audience chamber. The first disciples who followed Jesus were not satisfied with a hurried conversation with him. By the way, they said, Rabbi, where dwellest thou? They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day. So we may be admitted into closest communion with God when we pray. And that is why the psalmist David still says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And every now and then uh, we need to go into the secret place of the Most High. Oh yes, my friend, let those who desire the blessing of God knock and wait at the door of mercy with firm assurance saying, for thou, O Lord, hast said, Everyone that asketh, receive it, and he that seeketh, find it, and to him that knocketh, it shall be open. Acts, seek, knock. One writer says that the three different senses are involved in Acts, seek, and knock. Asking is verbal. Christians are to use their mouths 
and petition God uh, for their needs and desires. And believers are to seek uh, with their minds. Uh, this is more than asking. It is setting of priorities and a focusing of the heart. To knock involves physical movement, one in which the Christian takes action. Although asking and seeking are of great importance, they would be incomplete without knocking. And so that is why the Apostle John uh, said that Christians ought not uh, to love in word alone, but with actions also. And so in the same way, it is good to pray and to seek God. But if one does not also act in ways that are pleasing to God, all is for naught. It is no accident that Jesus said believers should love God with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind. And so the point seems to be that it doesn't matter whether you find God immediately close at hand, almost touchable with his nearness or hard to see, or even with barriers between, he will hear and he will give good things to you because you look to him and not to another. And so when we come to Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 through 10, it says, Or what man is there among you who, if his son acts for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he acts for a fish, will give him a serpent? Good fathers are eager to help their children. This is what fathers do. They give good gifts to their children. If you ask a child for a stone or snake, will you give it to him? No. What if he begs? No. What if he pleads? What if he says, I can't live without snakes? You will still say no. Children often ask for foolish things which are withheld. Likewise, the same is true with God. Often we plead for things uh, that to us seem like bread, but to God are like a poisonous snake. And so our Heavenly Father says no, not because he hates us, but because he loves us. Sometimes God's no is his surest sign of his love for us. And I say praise the Lord. Suppose your seven-year-old child asks you to play with a glass of bleach. What will you do? Will you say no and let uh, the child just cry? Now his tears show his immaturity. If you give him the bleach, you really don't love him at all. And so... I once read an interesting blog on the internet. I asked God uh, to take away my pain. God said, no, it is not for me to take away, but for you to give it up. I asked God to take away my handicapped child. God said, no, her spirit was whole. Her body was only temporary. I asked God to grant me patience God said, no, patience is a byproduct of tribulations. It isn't granted, it is earned. I asked God to give me happiness. And God said, no, I give you blessings. Happiness is up to you. I asked God to spare my pain. God said, no, suffering draws you apart from worldly cares and brings you closer to me and I say hallelujah amen I ask God to make my spirit grow God said no you must grow on your own but I will prune you to make you fruitful I ask God for all things that I may enjoy life and God said no I will give you life so that you may enjoy all things. I ask God to help me love others as much as he loves me. And God said, ah, finally you have the idea. And so we often ask for things that will harm us, things that might destroy us. It might be a new job. It might be a, for a bigger salary. It might be for a new husband. It might be for a new wife. But God sees through to the end and knows 
what we have asked for would harm us more than will help us. So in love, uh, he says no. Speaking of marriage, a husband who has six children begins to call his wife mother of six rather than by her first name. The wife amused at first chuckles, but after a few years, she grows tired of it. Mother of six, he would say, what's for dinner tonight? Get me a bear. She gets very frustrated. Finally, while attending a party together, the husband jokingly shouts, mother of six, I think it's time to go home. She immediately shouts back, I'll be right with you, father of four. Oh, my friend, we are living at a rather stressful time amid COVID-19. So the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi is appropriate. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, fate. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Yes, my friend. And so have you ever felt the urge to pray for someone and then just put it on a list and said, I'll pray for them later? Or has anyone ever called you and said, I need you to pray for me. I have this need. And so, my friend, it is said that a missionary on furlough told this true story while uh, visiting his home church in Michigan. Upon arrival in the city, he said, I observed two men fighting, one of whom had been seriously injured. I treated him for his injuries and at the same time uh, talked to him about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I then traveled two days camping overnight and arrived at home without incident. Two weeks later, I repeated my journey. Upon arriving in the city, I was approached by the young man I had treated. He told me uh, that he had known I carried money and medicine. He said, some friends and I followed you into the jungle knowing you would come and you would camp overnight. We plan to kill you and to take your money and drugs. But just as we were about to move into your camp, we saw that you were surrounded by 26 armed guards. At this, I laughed and said, I was certainly all alone out in the jungle campsite. And the young man pressed the point. However, said, no, sir. I was not the only person to see the gods. <clears throat> My five friends also saw the men, and we all counted them. It was because of those gods uh, that we were afraid, and we left you all alone. At this point in the sermon, one of the men in the congregation jumped to his feet and interrupted the missionary and asked if he uh, could tell him the exact date that this had happened. The missionary told the congregation the date, and the man who interrupted told him the story. He said, on the night of your incident in Africa, it was morning here and I was preparing to uh, go to play a game of golf I was about to putt when I felt uh, the urge to pray for you in fact the urging of the Lord was so strong I called men 
in this church to meet with me here in the sanctuary to pray for you. Yes, would all those men who met with me on that day stand up right now? The men who had met together to pray that day stood up. The missionary wasn't concerned with who they were. He was too busy counting how many men he saw. There were 26 men who stood up. This story is an incredible example of how the Spirit of the Lord moves in mysterious ways. And so, my friend, don't give up. Trust in the Lord. I invite you to bow your heads in a moment of prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for our telecast today. We thank you for the word which has gone forth. And so, Lord, I pray your blessing upon every person under the sound of my voice. I pray for all those who are suffering as a result of COVID-19. Lord, I pray that you may help us to realize that this world is not our home. And when thou shalt come, save us in your kingdom, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Before we close, I invite you to listen to this special song from Infinite Praise. <laughs> 